Some of our listeners may be familiar with Celeste's work, others may not be. For those who are not familiar with her work, how has her work really impacted Inya? Because I've seen online in other places, you point, you've pointed out and mentioned in the past that her work was really kind of a game changer for you guys. Yep. Celeste's work um, is a game changer. I will do it with every horse. All my horses do her. I do the, it's called pillar work, pillars one, two, and three. And um, it basically is the release of um, pillar number one is called the connection where the horse releases you, you work to release the brachiocephalic cephalic, um, under the neck and get it to stop firing. Um, horses are often, you know, that they're fight animals or so flight animals, excuse me. And so they're often holding themselves in their neck. Well, Enya was severely guarded in her neck. And so we had to do a lot of nerve. Um, Celeste had to do a lot of nerve work to help diminish that. Um, but also working through the pillars has changed my complete understanding of the thoracic sling and how it's developed. I mean, that's just a huge topic, <laughs> but um, you know, working through the pillars has developed the top line in a correct way, as well as develop the thoracic sling muscles and the tissues that support the horse's structures between their shoulders and their spine and their ribs and opens it up and allows the horse to actually carry themselves in an uphill manner on their own because they've developed their muscles correctly, not because we're riding them forward into contact and pulling them up. You know, we say we really pull the horses up, but we use a lot of upper body strength to, you know, get the horses on the bit or activate the hind end and half halt the front. Well, I got to tell you, my horses are going in better balance, better front end reach, better body back usage than they've ever gone in their lives, ever, hands down. And I am telling everybody that I work with and know about it, and I'm showing them how to do it. Has that, since you're a little art judge, has that created any conflict for you with? Well, that's a loaded question, Meredith. <laughs> <can> horse that? <laughs> yes, it has. How do you Correct. reconcile the two? How do you reconcile the two? Is that what you asked? Uh, yes. Or do, do you, are you able to? I am trying to figure that out, honestly, because we all have known that correct basics should trump movement, right? We know that. We've been told that. However, gate scores, although they've changed that um, with the um, collective marks, still can impact the overall score um, within each movement, of course. It is, it's a tricky one, Meredith, and I don't know how to give a straight answer on that because I am still really trying to, within this last year, with how much my growth has changed my methodology, methodologies and approaches with my own horses and the people I work with, it has created some challenges with judging. But I guess now more than ever, I know a good neck when I see one. And I know better balance when I see it uh, in a more correct way. And so I think it's helped me. And in many, I mean, I know it's helped me. I don't think I know. And then when I'm talking about contact, when I'm judging and I see short necks or low curly, you know, low poles and curly curled frames, I really just try to focus on my comments, really talking about allowing the horse to find a longer frame with a more correct level balance, not even thinking about an uphill balance at that point. I do grapple with, can I, you know, how do I judge and, and, and not be, I don't know what the word is, not frustrated really, but just challenged by having just even more knowledge of how the horse should go and seeing a lot of horses that just don't go that way. 
And I'm not, I am definitely not saying that I am better than anybody or anything. I mean, I am learning. I am trying to figure out how do I put this into my own writing and maintain it and protect the integrity of it because it is different than what it was a year ago. So I'm still trying to figure that out. And so I am not going to go out there and be judgmental of people because that's not what a good judge should do. A judge should educate, in my opinion, you know, and so that's what I'm trying to do and have always tried to do, but even more of a focus now on how I articulate things in those final remarks or in those small boxes, you know, I don't know if that answers that question. It does. I'd like to go back to something you mentioned about there being layers or levels of listening. Mm -hmm. A lot of horse people are proud of themselves for listening to their horses and consider themselves good listeners of their horse. Can you break down some of the levels that you saw in your own journey of listening to your horses? I might have mentioned it a little bit, you know, throughout there. I thought I was a good listener. I think that when I hit rock bottom, I knew that I was trying with all my heart to listen to my horses as best as I could. But then I met people like you or know people like you. I met Celeste, who is um, really gifted in listening in a more, uh, it's so hard to explain. I don't know if I have words for it, Meredith, because I'm sure there are words for it, but there's doing what you think is best because you're going through the motions of following protocols that you know. How are my horse's feet? Are they eating well? What does the vet say about it? Does their saddle fit? Uh, Is their bridle okay? You know, all those checklists, right? I'm listening to my horse. I'm watching how it goes under saddle or feeling it. Um, And I make adjustments to my tack if something doesn't seem right. But then there's, for me, it was the gut is all I can really bring it to is the gut was telling me that there wasn't something right. And how do I access that? How do I access those answers? And some people say, my animal, one day I just heard my horse. I think you might have had that experience, right? I did. And I know like another animal communicator that I work with, she said the same thing. She was grazing her horse one day and he just talked to her. And I've, I've been reading that um, Learning Their Language book. And Carter Williams. Recommended. Yeah. Super yeah. fabulous book. And um she gives many examples about one day someone just kind of heard the animal. I don't know if Anya ever, well, she was screaming at me, actually. I know she was. And she was screaming at me in every way she could through her body um, and in the saddle. And maybe in my mind, when I kept saying to myself, something's wrong, something's wrong, maybe that was her telling me in her own words, but I never had the experience of my horse directly speaking to me. I just was watching the body. I started studying her face more and the little nuances of things. And through also working with Celeste and the Masterson method, you really have, you, you really do learn to watch for the the twitches and the itches and the shakes and the relaxation state and the, the tear in the eye or the, the nostril, you know, doing its thing. And I had an experience. I'll tell you, this was a cool experience. Um, I have another horse. I have three horses, a four-year-old and talk about listening. Maybe she spoke to me and I finally heard her. We were doing the, um, pillar work that Celeste, you know, has taught me and cause I'm using that to help develop her under saddle. She's four. She kind of has some SI things going on. I know she, 
she, I know she does. And, um, I know that because I have that gut feeling that something's going on there. And I have for a while, I had a body worker look at her and they say, there's something going on in the SI. And then the, the animal communicator who spoke to her also said, yeah, she's tight back there. So we're doing the pillars and she reaches back across the left side of her body with her head and looks at her left hip, like she wants to itch it. So I step back away from her a little bit more to give her some space. But instead of reaching all the way back, she reaches her head out to me. And I was just compelled to put my arms out towards her nose. And I said, do you want me to to grab your face? Like, literally, I had this conversation with her because I'm talking to my horses now. Like, you speak to people. I am talking to my horses that way. Do you want me to grab your face? I put my hand out. She rests her nose in my mouth puts weight in it with her chin sideways craned around. And then I hold her, like I'm holding her pretty firmly at that point under her chin. And she's pulling on me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's having me do traction right now for the right side of her body. No joke. That's what was going on. And I thought, score one for Nikki. You finally figured it out at least once. (laughs) You know, like it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my God, I think I think I might've really heard what she was trying to tell me. Um, But, you know, when you talk about the layers, I think for me, it was just peeling back away the checklist of being a good horse owner to, to feeling the gut of being, we have those gut feelings all the time to actually listening to them, to peeling that back, to watching the horses more and interacting with them in a much calmer state of breath and and having absolutely no agenda no agenda take the agenda out the window that's one thing I've learned that's been beautiful from this whole process no agenda and with no agenda I started really seeing what they were telling me with their bodies and I don't really know, you know, everything that's going on. Obviously I'm not professing to do that. I still ask questions, you know, to Kenny, like, why are you always doing that with your head? You know, there's something going on with his highway. We kind of think, you know, and and that's just his little thing and we'll get there. But, um, I do feel like those were kind of my layers and I'm still definitely working on it. Yeah. What you said about, coming in with no agenda and just really watching their body language, watching the emotion on their face, watching for those little twitches really is huge. For me, the biggest red flag for me is a horse that doesn't want to interact. And I've had some close calls with horses that were quote unquote labeled aloof Mm -hmm. that what people might describe as aloof was a mountain of trauma. Yep. For sure. And I firmly believe now, although I've, you know, I've always, I firmly believe there are no horses that are bad horses. None. If a horse is behaving badly, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe there is a reason for it. Um, And so People get frustrated when sometimes when you don't have those instantaneous answers for things. And I work with people. You know, I am an instructor. I teach lessons, you know, on the weekend, school teacher by day. And it has really slowed down um, me and how I process through things. Therefore, it's slowing down my process with my students. There just are no quick fixes. And I think that that's something that we we all kind of feel like, oh, let's solve this problem so we can move on. Well, sometimes it takes a while, a long while. And it's just learning, like you said, you know, to, to know that that body language that they're sharing with us is, is their only means of communication. We have to pay attention to it. Yeah. And sometimes that grumpiness or that withdrawnness is also them trying to communicate, but where we might expect extroverted communication 
through nipping or ears back or kicking or, you know, tail swishing, whatever it is, is actually that withdrawal that is the their cry for help. And then later on, it's like, well, why did you stop? Well, because you haven't been listening to me. Mm-hmm. What were the things I was supposed to be listening to? It's all that withdrawn. What advice would, if your current Nikki were to go back and give the Nikki with the Inya who just had the cross tie incident, what advice would you give yourself? Make me cry again, Meredith. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would tell that person that trauma takes a long time to heal. And I would have told, I would tell myself back then that she really got, she really did a number on herself and you moved too fast. You asked for too much and you were trying to do quick fixes too. And I would tell that person, don't stop asking questions until you find that you really feel good about the answers you're getting. Horses, when they are injured, whether it's simple or big, emotional or physical, just like people, they need time to heal. And um, that I was so focused on my FEI horse making taking me to Grand Prix because I love her so much and she's my dream that I really lost sight of all the important stuff in between. And maybe someday we'll get to Grand Prix if her body allows her. And maybe not, but that is totally okay now with me. And that took me some time to process too. There's grief in all of that, huge grief. So if people listening to this have experienced trauma with their horse or an injury that could be life-changing or career-ending, the grief is real. But I've also been told and absolutely believe that horses have an incredible capacity to heal. And when given time, they might just be fine, you know, and that's what I hope for her. But if not, she'll always be my girl and she's not going anywhere. So what hopes do you have for your own growth as a horsewoman now? Well, I slow. It's funny. I just had this conversation with my mom this morning, so I'm ready for this one. <laughs> um, you know, I was talking with her about how it has really slowed down the process of things that I'm really, really taking the time. And I still have so much to learn, Meredith. I mean, my journey is not long. I'm 40 one years old and I have at least I'm hoping for you know 25 to 30 more years in the saddle so I'm not done learning yet but my my hope or what I see this doing is it's taking the time to really slow down and develop the connection and the relationship even more so with my horses in a more fine-tuned way um call calmer Uh, less of an agenda, but I actually think that by having that kind of attitude, it will put me further out. It, It will, it will actually achieve milestones in a short period of time. I'm experimenting with my four year old right now, actually. Um, you know, I spent, uh, she just lightly started last fall. Just a quick, ex- quick little explanation of your question, because this is what I was talking to my mom about. Maybe 10 rides last fall on her back walk trot. Uh, gave her all winter off to grow because she's kind of small, a little bit immature, needs time. Started doing um, the balance through method, um, balance through movement method that Celeste has, you know, been working with me on with her. Changed her entire physique, incredibly so. Um, gave her a top line, developed her muscles, in a beautiful way without even sitting on her. 
connected me to her because there's a lot of connection time that you spend with your horse, just waiting for them to release and relax and be soft in their neck um, in pillar one. And then teaching her the abduction exercises allowed for us to get to know each other even better. You know, what side is she stiffer on on the ground? What hind leg does she step more open with? Which direction? Where does she lick and chew? When does she yawn? You know, and so taking the time to do this groundwork in a completely different way, I believe is more powerful for me. And I will do this forever in the future. I will never not do this stuff. I mean, it's in my, it's in me now. And, um, and it's slowed the process down, but you know what, Meredith, I got on that horse, having not rid her, ridden her all winter long, barely lunged her because I, um, am now feeling like lunging on small circles is even less of a good thing than I used to think before and not with side reins at all and big circles, lunging, uh, trot walk, you know, maybe 10 minutes because she doesn't, I don't want to disrupt her balance and develop incorrect posture and got on her by myself, hoping that my little Apple watch would call 911 if I fell off <laughs> and, and walked and trotted around the whole arena with absolutely nothing. And that was five rides ago. And I've done that, you know, since a couple weeks ago when I got on her and I alternate you know, doing a mostly groundwork day versus a, you know, groundwork with riding. It's just slowed my process. But what I'm saying is that I've had absolutely no silly willy nilly baby stuff. I know her well. She knows me well. Our trust is strongly developed now. I'm not asking her to quickly let's lunge, let's go, let's get on, let's see what happens. It's just, there's an agenda, but not, not a, it's a fluid one. So that's just an example of what I was telling my mom this morning of how it has impacted me and changed my outlook. That's great. Did that answer that question kind of? It did. Okay. And for our listeners, um, to wrap things up, if you'd like to learn more about working with Nikki, you can mm-hmm. visit the website HTTPS, MiariStables.com. That's M-I-A-R-I. S-T-A-B-L-E-S dot com. And for more information about me, uh, the host, Meredith Crawford, and my exploration into the depths of the horse-human relationship, you can visit HTTPS colon backslash backslash the lab dot horse. Thank you for tuning in today.